chart either way just to make sure. So there will be a section where you have to, it'll give you like a description, it'll say something like which of these um, pictures has a carboxyl group or which of these contains a sulhydryl group or a thiol or whatever. So you definitely need to know the functional groups and their names and be able to match them to a picture. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll write the names here and then if anybody wants to get a snapshot of that, that's fine. Um, so this is a carboxyl. Sometimes it's also called a carboxylic acid where you should recognize either name. Carboxyl or carboxylic acid. This is hydroxyl, phosphate. Is it carboxyl or amino? Correct. This is an amino. And you are actually very correct. There is actually a question about that as that asks which two functional groups are always found in amino acids. And it's these two, the carboxyl and the amino. And I actually have a picture of an amino acid coming up anyway. But amino acids always have these two groups. Um, this is an aldehyde. This is a ketone. And then this one has two names. This is the sulfhydryl, and it's also, right, sometimes called a thiol. So any of those, in fact, if I left one off, it's not on the midterm. These are the ones that are fair game for being in a picture where you have to match it. And, and you are correct, there's also a question about which ones are found in an amino acid. So it's going to be those two, the carboxyl and the amino that are always found in amino acids. So, yeah, so if you want to get a picture of this slide as well, you can do that now, and then I'm going to... Um, move on to the next thing. And we're going to talk about the, the actual uh, four compounds, organic compounds in organic chemistry. So. Monday. Yeah, this is it. So do you want a picture of that? Yeah. All right. All right, I'll come back to it. All those are fair game. Okay, so what you need to know specifically about each of the four organic compounds. So carbohydrates are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a you typically in a one to two to one ratio, like C six H twelve O six one to two to one, and their building blocks are monosaccharides. I wasn't sure which classes we did, so I'm just going from here for every class. Um, monosaccharides can be put together. The name of the reaction that hooks them together is, it can either be called dehydration synthesis or a condensation reaction. And I actually have a picture of one on the next slide. But in essence, what happens is you have two compounds and H and OH get together and leave, and that forms water, and then the two things are hooked together. In the case of, of sugars, they happen to have an oxygen in the middle, but that's not necessarily always true. The bottom line is water leaving and, and that hooking them together is a condensation reaction, and I have a picture of it on another slide as well. When you hook together monosaccharides, you get polysaccharides. So the building blocks are monosaccharides, but if you put a bunch of those together, you get polysaccharides. And I would say probably if you wanted to remember one example of starch would be a good example of a polysaccharide. And honestly, that's pretty much all you need to know about carbohydrates. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, their building blocks are monosaccharides. Um, they can be put together using condensation or hydro, um, condensation reactions. The opposite of this, breaking it apart, is called hydrolysis. And again, I actually have a better picture on the next slide of condensation and hydrolysis. So I'll go over that again in a second. All right, lipids. Lipids are also made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but they're mostly long chains of hydrocarbons, which are basically carbon and hydrogen. Um, and because of that, one thing that you should remember about, about lipids that's sort of unique to them is that they are all insoluble in water. Their building
building blocks are fatty acids. And you should know the difference between saturated and unsaturated. And I actually put a picture on the next slide, so I'll show you that just to make sure everybody knows the difference. So I'm going to go to the next slide, and I'll come back to this and finish the chart in a second. Um, here is the picture. Actually, two pictures. Let me go through them one at a time. So I'll move this off the side. So this is, is a picture showing a condensation reaction, what it looks like. Um, you have two monosaccharides. Don't let the big, all the stuff scare you. But the bottom line is OH from one and hydrogen from the other. They get together and leave as water. And then these two are basically hooked together. That's a condensation reaction. And a hydrolysis is the opposite where water comes in and they break apart. So if you just understand the definition and what happens in a condensation versus a hydrolysis. Um, the other picture is saturated, so there will be a picture, and it will either be a saturated or an unsaturated fatty acid. So, yes, so, and you'll have to know that too. So, keep in mind what you're looking for in the saturated, which the word got cut off up there, but this is a saturated one. No double bonds. Don't count this. Don't look at that and think it's unsaturated because of that double bond. You're looking for double bonds between the carbons. Notice in this one, there's the double bond. That's what makes this unsaturated. And it will not necessarily bend. Even though in real life they do bend when they have double bonds to save space, they'll a lot of times draw the double bond in the picture, but they won't actually make it bending. Saturated or solid at room temperature. And then the unsaturated tend to be liquid at room temperature, which is why unsaturated are better for you uh, than saturated are. So from a picture, make sure you can identify whether it's a saturated or an unsaturated fatty acid, and also whether it would be a solid or a liquid at room temperature. So if it's a saturated fatty acid in the picture, it would be a solid at room temperature. If it's unsaturated, it would be a liquid at room temperature. So any questions about that? Yes. Correct. If it has more double bonds, the melting point would be lower. And there's nothing even that specific on there. Like just knowing solid versus liquid at room temperature is all you have to know. I tried to keep it more general. I didn't get into that. Yeah, super detail. Yes. All right. I'm going to go back to the other uh, table we were filling out. So that's pretty much that's everything you should know about lipids. Proteins contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. So there are two other elements that we find in proteins that we don't find in carbs and lipids. And nucleic acids contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So if you were asked a question, for example, if you were told that uh, you were you put, a, let's say, a plant in an environment and there was no nitrogen available, which one of these four would they still be able to make even if there was no nitrogen available? Right, they would still be able to make lipids and carbs because lipids and carbs are only made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but they would not be able to manufacture any proteins or nucleic acids um, because those would require nitrogen. So that would be like an example of something I could ask you just to see that you understand that lipids and carbs are only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and then proteins and nucleic acids require nitrogen. Um, all proteins, their building blocks are amino acids. And all amino acids have an amino group, which we already talked about, and a carboxyl group. And I actually have a picture of an amino acid on the next slide or coming up as well, so we'll go over that. Um, the other thing you'll need to know about proteins is their levels of structure, and that's coming up on another slide as well. Keep in mind, our nucleic acids, their building blocks are nucleotides. DNA is a good example. ATP is a good example. You should know that DNA, the nucleic acid, controls what proteins you make. Which is, in essence, your heredity. So the reason why DNA is like, it controls your genetics or your heredity is because technically what DNA does is it determines what proteins are made. And the proteins then give you all your enzymes, all your pigments, all your hormones, your hair, your nails, most of your structures. So the reason you look the way you do and your cells do the jobs they do is because of the proteins.
proteins and the directions for making them are in the DNA. And that's actually all you need to know about nucleic acids. So there are a few more things you need to know about proteins, but that's going to be on another slide. So if anybody wants a picture of this slide, now's the time to get that. And then we're going to move on and I'm going to give you a couple of specifics about proteins that you need to know in addition to this stuff. So any questions on this slide? Protein and nucleic acids are the ones that have nitrogen. Exactly. And the other, and then right, carbs and lipids would not require it. You'll know the question when you see it. All right. Uh, we already covered this. This was the saturated and unsaturated. This one? Oh, the chart? Sure. Here you go. Okay. All right. Um, the last thing about proteins you should know. Actually, two things. I'm going to move this out of the way. So this is a picture of you should know what an amino acid looks like, and you should know how amino acids are hooked together. So here's the thing. When amino acids hook together to build a, a protein, it'll always be the OH of a carboxyl group and the hydrogen of an amino group. In other words, they have to line up in such a way that the carboxyl of one and the amino of the other one would face each other. Then they could hook together. The carboxyl group of one has to be facing the amino group of the one next to it. I mean, actually, if you look at it, they both should be facing. The bottom line is both amino acids should be facing the same way. In other words, if you had, for example, this one on the right, I mean on the left, if you had an, this, this one with the amino group on the left, Sorry. And then next to it, you had one that looked like this with the amino group on the right. These would not be lined up properly to connect to each other because carboxyl and carboxyl can't connect and amino and amino can't connect. So if you were asked which of these are lined up correctly so they can connect to make a bond, you would want to look for the amino acids lined up in such a way that, the carb that basically the amino is on the same side and the carboxyl so that a carboxyl and an amino face each other and then they could connect to each other. And then this is the bond they would make. Does that make sense? That's how they would have to be lined up. You can't have them, you can't have two carboxyl groups facing each other or two amino groups facing each other. They both have to be drawn the same way so that one carboxyl connects to an amino. And then that's going to make your peptide bond. All right, and the last thing you need to know about proteins and actually, this will be the last thing you need to know about any of the biochemistry stuff. So I'm just going to move this out of the way. Are the levels of structure. There's going to be a question um, where it's going to ask. It's going to actually what it's going to probably do is describe levels. And you'll have to identify which levels of structure are being described. So the levels of structure in a protein describe sort of the order that everything is put together. So the first level of structure is called primary. They could either say the word primary or they could put a one with a little degree. The primary structure of a protein is the order of the amino acids. And this is the one, this is the level technically that's determined by DNA. When we did the lab activity on this, you had the pipe cleaner and you put the different colored beads on it. You were basically determining the primary structure when you put the different colored beads on there because you were determining what order to put the amino acids. The secondary level of structure, they can either write the word secondary or they can do a two with a little degree, are the alpha helix and the pleated sheet. This is basically areas of a chain that folds up into patterns. That's, that's the secondary level. So if you see anything, they would probably even use the words alpha helix. If you see alpha helix, you know they're talking about secondary structure. Tertiary structure is how the whole chain folds up. All proteins have a tertiary structure. It's the final shape of the entire thing once the whole strand folds into whatever it's going to be. Remember, if it's an enzyme, it would fold into a particular shape with an active site and all of that. And then the last level of structure, quaternary, not all proteins have this. 